Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with none other than Marty O'Brien. Yay! Hey, <laughs> <Hey>, thank you. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Doing great, Marty, doing great. Marty has played with a plethora of acts and players. He is, you know, does a ton of touring and studio work and all kinds of interesting things, and we'll definitely want to get into that. But as always, we go back to the past. How did you get started in music and particularly on bass? It's kind of a funny story about how I got started on the bass. I was like I was like 12 years old and I just was starting to listen to rock bands and I and I wanted to be in a band, you know. But you didn't really d differentiate what the guitar and bass did, you know, and I thought it was a cool idea. But I always remember the moment when I realized the impact the bass has, you know. I was on my BMX bike when I was a kid. I'll never forget. I was leaning on the handlebars, listening to this older, it was like an older kid. He was like a few years older. And he had like a little boom box on the front step of a friend's house. And he starts playing Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple, you know. Now, this is in the 80s. So it's, it's years after the song came out. But I knew the song. But it starts, you know, with like the hi-hat and the guitar. And, you know, and all the frequencies are up here. They're all high, you know. And, and then he goes... Right before the bass comes in, he goes, he goes right here. I love when the bass comes in, and he kind of air basses, dum dum dum, you know, and it just filled that frequency filled the whole bottom, and that was the moment when I went, like wow, like it it had a huge impact on me, like wow, like all everybody else in the band was up here in the frequencies, and all of a sudden this thing came in, this growl, dum 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 dum, and it just, and I was like, well, so from that day on, I go home and I'm watching MTV. <laughs> And I'm and I'm and I'm listening and I'm the frequency is what is what I love the most. Mm -hmm. And I truly like I remember watching videos and oh I, I could start to hear it. You could start to pick it out. And then I'd see people playing it. And you know, I'm like 12 and I see people on MTV and I go oh and I started to click like oh the big thick strings are the bass and it had a big impact on me. That one moment where I realized the impact that frequency has, you know, that low end. So I, that's what that's when I got started. I started taking a. I took a couple lessons in town, maybe four or five lessons, mm -hmm. and I realized I just didn't like having to, the regimen of it. And then I just started teaching myself like just how to figure out like Led Zeppelin songs and stuff. And that's how I got started, yeah. Very nice. Well, and for some of our younger viewers, there's a few objects that you might not be familiar with. The boombox was <laughs> a unit with speakers yes. that many times ran on batteries, and sometimes they would play cassettes. Our first one had an eight-track player. There's another archaic uh, yeah. thing in it, but you know, radio cassettes, yeah. eight tracks, I, and I, I came up in the cassette era. There you go, and they had. I think one of the characteristics is that they paid special attention to bass that for, for the first time, you would get some kind of subwoofer kind of action, whereas traditionally yeah. regular record players and stuff, it, it was full spectrum, but with the boom boxes, a lot of times they'd even go, you know, bass boost or something. It's got yeah. more that is, that's going on there. So they were, geared, they were geared towards like the hip hop scene. So that's probably why they added that, you know, a lot of 808s and all that stuff. Yeah, I remember it like, my eyes opened up. I was like, whoa, the bass. <laughs> there you go. There you I go. I learned more about the bass. What is this? Yeah. And uh, the other detail that many of you may have missed is that back in the day, MTV actually used to have music. So yeah. <laughs> they had like maybe one game show and then came more game shows and more game shows and dating shows. And then it was like, where's the music? Yeah, those were the best years. I, I used to totally... Yeah get sucked in and the videos usually had almost a Pavlovian effect when you heard even the first few bars of something playing in the background you'd go running to see the video I if it was Van Halen one of my favorites Dire Straits you know money for nothing all you had to do was hear the opening and you're like okay I gotta go yes I gotta go watch you the TV on all day it was like having the radio on and then when I want you know it was amazing absolutely well moving along from that again you've played with so many people, as I mentioned, Lita Ford, Daughtry, Tommy Lee, you've played at OzFest, you've been on TV. I mean, a, a, a range of people that it's not even kind of in one particular area. There's a lot of rock in there, but 
you know, I saw it, you know, Kelly Clarkson, Celine Dion. So there's been, you know, a little, yeah, that, little, that's little... actually what I'm most proud of is the wide range. Cause like, you know, the, the resume has like disturbed and then Kelly Clarkson, static X and then Celine Dion. I, I think that's funny to me, you know, and it's, and I'm most proud of it too, is because when you're first trying to get into the studio world, first of all, nobody wants like, you know, at first I thought, Ooh, I played for a couple big acts. So like now I'll start try to get into the studio world and for years it was like no 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 there's there's studio guys and then there's you who plays in live that was the the attitude you got mm -hmm. and also too like you're not you're probably not going to play on a celine dion record if you're pegged as like a metal guy not yeah. a bad thing but if like you're like i had just done a tour with like disturbed filling in on bass probably unlikely some producer is going to be like let's get that guy that plays metal for the celine dion record but <laughs> So that's why I'm most proud of is uh, kind of breaking through the stereotypes and uh, and getting on some pop albums as well as metal tours and so yeah it's it's been fun yeah I had a lot of fun doing it too very cool well and with such a diverse portfolio where do you kind of find your inspiration like how do you create your your baselines do you draw from you know, again you you had such a, a background in rock but with all these new challenges. That, yeah, I guess you just pull it from the things I grew up over the years. Like I might, if I tour with, like I mostly tour with rock bands, so here I am with this growly, dirty tone. But when I get in the studio, I usually bring the old vintage P basses that I'm looking for like that James Jamerson or, or like John Paul Jones kind of round tone, which mm -hmm. is so unlike what I do live because I play the Spectres and other like active uh, Charvels that, you know, get you that, that growl. But mm -hmm. in the studio, it's like I bust out the old vintage stuff. And I don't know, you just kind of, it's kind of an instinct that, you know, you wouldn't get called for a Kelly Clarkson session and then turn on the the dis <laughs> the uh, growling bass tone. It's, I don't know, you just kind of picture what would go here well with this. And I, I channel, try to channel the, the James Jamerson or the John Paul Jones for that stuff, you know, nice clean tone and land on the kick drum. <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. go. Well, and I've even heard from a, a lot of studio musicians if they were to show up when they showed up at a studio with like a five string instead of a four string that they're going, what, you're going to play that? Not to mention the extended range guys. You show up with six or, or, or seven strings that are like, uh, we didn't want the guitar. We wanted a bass player. And I think that's part of what helped me get into the session world, too. It, it helped me when I was a kid, too. Like I, I was just a local kid and I wanted to play in band like these local bands I would go see. And I was like, the next time a band like that needs a bass player, I need to be prepared so they know that I have pro gear, you know? So I always made sure I had good stuff. And then when I started getting into the session world, I was like, I need a vintage P, but you know, you, you want to have the tools and all mm -hmm. the options. So I saved up and got a vintage P bass. I got a 61 P bass, which I cherish to this day. And I've used it on a lot of tons of stuff. And uh, you know, you show up to that, you just want to show, like you work with a new producer, and I'd show up with like a fretless, couple five strings, couple vintage P basses, modern like active basses, just like, and they're like, wow, you got it. So the hope is that, you know, you go in there and you do some pop song with the guy, but then a month later he was like, hey, I know you have five strings too. I'm doing this rock track. You, we come over and do like, just show up with all the options and all the tools. And that was my goal always to just be the guy that, oh, he's prepared. He's got it all. We need fretless, call him up, you know, so. That was the goal, and hopefully it worked. So there you go. Well, it sounds like the perfect justification for gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> yes. Well, I need it, right? <laughs> totally, totally. Since we're talking about gear, and again, you have such a, a wide palette. Of course, the eye always strays to everything behind you, like the kid yeah. at the toy store. <laughs> but how are you getting your sound? What are the kind of the main elements with the tools that you're playing on? Almost everywhere I go, I use Aguilar amps. And that's, that's funny how I got into that. I had, I was using another brand for years and I'll never forget. I, I went to go do a session for like a video game and it was the, the original bass player for the band Hoobastank had, had some gear in a studio and somebody said, you can plug into the, this head right here, you know, in this cab, if you want to try this, I was like, ah, oh, you know, and I tried it and I was like, Oh, what is that? Like, come on, you know? But I, I was like, no, I, I have all my all the stuff I need. I don't need to be switching gear and new amps, none of that. And then it happened again. Like I used somebody's amp like a year later or two years, this Aguilar. 
and it was like, oh no, it was like I loved it so much. I was like, I got, I just have to switch. So, uh, it, Aguilar, it seems like it's geared towards one genre, I guess, kind of. But it, like, they don't seem to push it towards the heavy rock bands or anything. But it, you can use it for anything. It's like, it's a supercharged amp beautiful clean tones and you can just dig into it and so that that's a part of it and then for basses it just depends what the gig is you know if it's like a live rock band like i said before you know more of a modern tone with the you know p and j pickups active and you know or if it's a session of usually the vintage stuff i got a couple old 50s and 60s ones that i bring and i just love it you know and it's so different so you know even the 50s and 60s basses when i i the 61 p bass i used on almost every pop session ever and then i was like i really want a 52 p bass mm. but then it, the thought was like am i stupid for buying just another vintage p bass you have one it's it's that's all you need for that and then i got it and i was like but it's so different than the than the the 52 is so different than the 61 i mean they're in that ballpark but they're so different so then that was my justification for for, <laughs> for getting it right there you go that's my reason they're all different they're all different that's what that's all this important but now there's one common thing with all of them and preference in strings what are you playing on elixir strings i converted to elixir years ago and i will never go back and you know they're coded so they blast it and for some reason my sweat it must be like alien sweat because with any other brand, and when I play a, a you know like some big rock show, you're sweating, and my the sweat of my hands just kills the tone of a set of strings in one show. I mean, the next show it's like unusable. It sounds like a, a twenty year old set of strings. It, it's like really bad. And you know, with this with the uh, that tone you're looking for, kind of that growl, it just goes away. Then I did the elixirs, and I was like, "Wow, they last! I mean, they it just protects it from my sweat, and they last forever. Like it's amazing." And another interesting thing that nobody ever mentions, and I don't think I've ever even said it, was when you buy a brand new set of strings, usually they're super bright when you first put them on, like almost too much. Like ooh, like I used to like when they would just wear out just a little bit, and then they then they land in that zone of like ooh, they've got brightness, they've got low end, but they're not too you know high end. And with the elixirs, when I put them on, they're right in that zone already. They're maybe because of the coating, they're not too super, super bright, and they're just in that perfect zone that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And then they just stay like that forever. I mean, eventually you do have to change them, but it's amazing how long they last. And I, I'll, yeah, I'll always use elixir. They're amazing. Nice. And are there any other particular elements in your gear that are particular things that you depend on? Not too many pedals right now. I do I do have that new uh, Getty Lee Moving Pictures anniversary pedal. Ooh, oh. that's, that's <laughs> thick and sweet. Uh, but yeah. no, not a lot of, I mean, I have a ton of pedals, but I don't, that's not part of my usual. Gotcha. Been using Charvel five string basses and some Spectres on the road too, some Fenders, and Levy straps on all the basses. Nice. Uh, I put okay. the same six levy straps on all my touring bases 12 years ago i was thinking about this the other day put them on 12 years ago and just the same straps so that they don't break they don't wear so the same the same straps for over a decade excellent wow. excellent <laughs> yeah so as we look forward what's in the works what's coming in the future after 10 years of touring with lita ford i got offered to play for the band daughtry back in beginning of last year and i started with them in may and so i just had a, a busy year touring with them and it was great and in about two weeks we get started again with like production couple production rehearsals and then we uh hit the road and they they're hinting that it's going to be a busy year first show is in vegas like the third week of february and then a couple other things coming up that aren't announced yet and then we're going to the uk and very exciting, we're playing Royal Albert Hall, which blows my mind. That's like, yeah. so very excited about that. It's like a super historic venue that's over, I think, uh, 125 years old or 150 years old. It's crazy. Yeah. I've seen pictures. <laughs> has given speeches there. That's how, that's how historic it is. So, uh, wow. And it's a beautiful venue. I've never even been. So it's, it's always been one on the list. So it's like, wow, we're playing Royal Albert Hall. So. That's uh, 
it's a two week tour in March. We're hitting about like six or seven cities and finishing with London on the uh, 26th or 27th. Yeah, we're excited. Very excited. Nice. And, uh, and then apparently a bunch of stuff coming up. So a lot of touring with Daughtry this year. Yeah. Very, very cool. And yeah. if people want to stay on top of where you're going to be, because there's so many dates and they might go, hey, you're going to be in a town near me. If they go to MartyO'Brien.com, is that one of the best places to look? Yeah. Yeah, all the stuff's on there. It's kind of like the hub. You can find all the social media links from there, MartyO'Brien.com. You know, the, the usuals, the Instagram, the Facebook, yeah. all that stuff. Which, yeah. Since you mentioned them, Instagram, Facebook, or at Marty O'Brien. On Twitter, it's Marty underscore O'Brien. Yeah. If people are looking, so they, they can check out. You stay pretty active on your social media stuff? Yeah. Good. Uh, part of it is because I like to do a lot of, like, uh, exploring and hiking and things when I'm on the road. So it's a, it's a mix of uh, here I am at the show, but then it's like here I am on this trail. <laughs> it's a lot of, lot, of, lot of that stuff. Here I am. I have a life and I do other things as well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, Marty, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. Folks, keep an eye on Marty's website, on his social media. You might see him in a town near you and catch right. his show. Very exciting stuff. You've seen him here, Marty O'Brien on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. <laughs>